and welcome to This is USG, a video podcast by the universities at Shady Grove. Nine universities, one campus, great results. I'm Ann Kadimian, Executive Director of the Universities at Shady Grove. The pandemic has severely impacted and stressed individuals, families and communities, all educational institutions, healthcare institutions, businesses, and nonprofits alike. It has also, at the heart, tested the government, especially local governments, to respond, to mitigate the risk of COVID-19, to protect the community, to support families, and to keep businesses afloat until the rapid pace of commerce resumes once again. And the government now must guide vaccinations, reopening, balancing health and safety with the energy and momentum of an in-person community once again. Tonight, we have an opportunity to learn more about Montgomery County's management of the COVID-19 pandemic and what lessons can be learned for the future. Our guest is an at-large member of the Montgomery County Council, a champion of the environment, a leader in fostering a more sustainable county, and an innovator over the past decade in addressing challenging economic times that have impacted the county, a longtime advocate and champion for social security, and a leader in promoting voter participation. Today, he is leading the effort to plan for a global pandemic response and biodefense center in Montgomery County. Please welcome Council Member Hans Reamer. Council Member Reamer, welcome to This is USG. Thank you, Anne. I'm really glad to be here. It's such an honor to be with you and I love USG. So thanks for having me on. <laughs> thank you for that. We love USG too. And it's just such a, an honor to have you here tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I wonder if we could start um, in a real uh, kind of informational way. Maybe you can share your path to becoming a county council member um, and maybe share a little bit with us too about what you see as the core responsibilities of a county council member. Sure, thank you. Um, well, I grew up in California and I went to the University of California at Santa Cruz. My family, my parents were always very involved in the community. I would, they were involved both locally, Neighborhood Watch, PTA. They're also involved in national causes, uh, ACLU, or you know, very, uh, very political. You know, they believe very strongly in government as being a part of the solution to the challenges that we faced. And growing up in Oakland, California, as I did, it was a very, it was a community where there was a huge difference between those who had opportunity and those who didn't. And I felt very strongly from the youngest age that I felt compelled to try to respond to that challenge and to be a part of something different because, yeah, just you know it felt wrong and it, to me we needed to do something about it um growing to college i pursued my interests after kind of uh you know not pursuing a whole lot of other things i thought i might want to do one day like maybe being a lawyer or a judge or maybe being you know going into business i really settled in my passions uh which are social change and and um kind of like more humanities that like the maybe those, that, that dimension of life. And that led me into public policy and government and, and um, social change. So as an intern in college, I, I got an intern in Washington, DC, and I came to a public policy organization. And then they invited me back after school and bringing some of my entrepreneurial skills, my, my parents were both entrepreneurs, they passed that on to me, bring some of my entrepreneurial skills I started my own nonprofit. It was a public policy organization right after, right out of college. Got a lot of help from many of Washington's great progressive nonprofit sector leaders and um, kind of grew from there. Took on campaigns to protect social security, to get young voters engaged in politics and ran the political program for Rock the Vote. Um, got to know uh, the future president, Barack Obama, through my wife. Uh, who was uh, ran the Congressional Black Caucus's political committee and uh, went to work for him as his youth vote director in uh, 2006, seven. And so, you know, that was kind of my, my path through national politics. Uh, my wife and I moved to Silver Spring uh, and loved it, of course, and decided to run for the county council. 
Um, didn't win my first time. A lot of times you don't, you know, you don't win your first time. But in 2010, I kind of figured it out and put it together and I ran and, and I won and I, I beat, uh, I ran in an environment with four incumbent council members at large, got more votes than three of them. And uh, the rest is history. That's great. So as a county council member, what do you think are the most important um, responsibilities that you have? What, what are the points of focus on the county council that you think are most important? Well, there are so many, it's hard to just pick a few. That's what I love about the council is, you know, in local government, you, everything, it's kind of a crossroads of every issue that faces the world. And, you know, when you are in national government or national politics, you tend to have a specialization in a specific area. In local government, often you're having to move through all of those areas all the time. So your specialty is sort of doing everything in a way. My one of the one of the roles I really cherish as a council member is being a someone that the community will come to people in the community will come to with their ideas, with their feedback, with their thinking. And it informs me and my thinking and it makes me more effective. So I view that role as just being a, a, a filter for the wisdom and, you know, the experience and, and the vision and the values of the community and then bringing that to bear in the conversations that we have and so often i what i bring to the table in deliberations at the county council is something i heard from somebody that they shared with me because they have some knowledge or expertise or just they just care a lot and you know they wanted to tell me how that it, it something seems to them so i think that's what representative government is all about and i think that is probably my most cherished responsibility. But the many roles that we have at the council, I mean, I am working on public policy issues to build the community that we want to live in and to really uh, tackle our challenges going forward for the future. So, you know, working on issues like police reform or climate change or economic development, you know, we've got to have governmental leaders that are willing to take the long view, you know, come up with very specific ideas and then cast some tough votes, do some hard work to make it happen. And if we don't have that kind of leadership, then we kind of stagnate and we fall behind. And uh, I think that's that's always the challenge for any community. Yeah, you know, listening to you talk, um, Hans, if I may, uh, I hear some really important things standing out. One is your focus on entrepreneurial thinking, the entrepreneurial mindset and how important that is in public policy. I don't think we always put put those two together, but it's clear that that's been a real hallmark of your your efforts is entrepreneurial thinking, especially during the previous recession when you came on board, there were a lot of economic challenges and a lot of a lot of creative thinking that went into that. That's one thing that stands out, but I love the way you just described your primary role being a filter for the wisdom of the community and for their ideas and their values. That's a really wonderful explanation of represent, representation, I think, and, um, and a great way to understand uh, your role. So we are a year and a half uh, into and hopefully coming out of this pandemic now. People are getting vaccinated, good things are going along. Taking the, taking the long view, looking back to you know, February, March of 2020 and to now, how do you think we've done? How do you think we've done in responding to this, this pandemic? It's been, you know, we, we struggled for a while without a kind of a broad national strategy. Local governments really had to step up and had to really take the reins with this and, and really try to protect people in the most immediate sense. And to your great point, um, in local government, in county government, you, you can't just dive into one area of specialization. You have to be familiar with all of the interconnecting parts. And so the council has had to do that. Um, what, what's your perspective on how we've done here? Where, what, do you, what do you see as the things that we did really well? And what do you th think are things we need to work on? Well, it should be no surprise that our community really rose to the occasion. Um, and we have amazing people in this county. They're very caring. Uh, they're very resourceful. We, we are the home of tens of thousands of people who work at NIH, FDA, you know, HHS. Uh, we, we, are the, we are the home to just so many people providing global leadership in public health. Um, I think a disproportionate share of our community is actually charting the course for this country and, the, and this world and its 
response to the pandemic. So it, sh it should be no surprise that our residents are more diligent about public health measures like masking or you know, not dining indoors in an unsafe way, uh, that they're more willing to um, you know, have restrictions to promote health at the same time, you know, more assertive in getting vaccinated. I think we're one of the, I, I saw the other day that if, if you put our county on a kind of spectrum of countries and the share of their population getting fully vaccinated, that we're one of the leading jurisdictions in the world to, to get fully vaccinated. You know, our residents have been driving to, all throughout the DMV to get their appointments. Um, so I think on a, on a lot of measures, we are, we're doing better than most. At the same time, you know, it has been an enormous strain, an enormous challenge. And, you know, I, a lot of different groups of people really come to mind. We have a huge immigrant community. We have a lot of our residents are not as plugged into public health policy or uh, may not even have a primary care doctor that is their regular doctor. And for, for them, what they hear about, you know, getting vaccinated may not seem like something particularly different from wearing a mask or, you know, having other restrictions. It's just one of these things that's kind of out there. You know, there's real issues with access to our public health response that we need to deal with. Think a lot about our small businesses. I mean, our my sister runs a restaurant. I used to work in restaurants like our restaurants have been crushed, our whole hospitality sector. Broadly, our economy seems to be doing remarkably well, but narrowly, there are sectors that have been absolutely decimated. And, you know, the restaurants is a, is a good example, uh, but other, other hospitality industry, uh, you know, sectors. So there are some deep issues. And I think over the long term, probably none more than just trying to accelerate the educational attainment of our students who have spent more than a year uh, getting less than their full education. And you know that's gonna have real repercussions that we're gonna have to tackle very, very assertively in the next several years. Um, but you know, I think we are a community that can pull it together and, and you know, lead in our response, um, but it, it has been difficult, that's for sure. What do you think are some of the lessons that we can draw from responding I mean, you've highlighted the importance of how, you know, Montgomery County has been on the cutting edge, some great minds, a, a lot of very dedicated people to the public health approach. And so, so Montgomery County has been really on the, you know, on the, on the front end in terms of being able to respond. But what are some of the lessons we can draw from this? Are there, are there insights in terms of mitigating risk in the future? I'm thinking yeah. about you know, uh, the, the next pandemic, heavens for, heaven forbid, um, or, you know, that next collective emergency or public health emergency. Are there, are there insights or lessons you think that we can glean from this that, um, that we can apply the next time around? Well, I think, you know, the biggest one is that those things that we know can probably happen are going to happen. And those scenarios that we, that we have foreseen, um, you know, they, they are inevitable if we don't prepare for, and we should prepare for them and try to avert them. So we've all known of the risk of global pandemics. I think probably going back, you know, 20 years now, it's something we have heard about, you know, concerns about avian flu, swine flu. So we, we've known it's been out there, but uh, I don't think any of us really thought it would happen in our lifetimes necessarily and, and started to think about preparing for that, the, the enormity of what we are doing now to respond is just, it's staggering. I mean, the amount of money that we are having to spend to forestall massive economic recession, the amount of investment in, you know, meeting payroll and unemployment benefits and small business support. You know, when you look at what the federal government is doing, it is one of the biggest governmental responses in in generations and you know some of that um will there will be some deep and long-lasting reforms that, that come with it but the cost of prevention uh is you know probably at this point one millionth the cost of of you know addressing the problem after it's here and so we've got to get more serious about all of the threats to our long-term future pandemics are one climate change 
is another, you know, the scenarios that we envision for climate change, they will happen if we don't take action. And in many ways, they could be far worse. They will be far worse than what we've experienced with COVID. But in any event, you know, we do need to grapple now urgently with uh, the many ways that we'll have pandemics in the future and, and better prepare for them because we, we can't do this again. And the reality is the next virus could be out there already. It could have already started circulating, you know, in some setting somewhere around the world. So it, it's possible that this will be more common um, and we're going to have to really make big investments now to uh, stop pandemics from, from taking off through really effective response measures. Yeah, it really, it really is. What I hear from you, it really is kind of adjusting our mindset, you know, to be thinking more about kind of long-term planning and just, to, just as the challenge you lay out with with climate change, you know, how how we we have to take a long view in order to get our heads around these um, efforts and to really invest in them. So, um, but I think our I think our county is up to it. I think our, I'm sure our county is up to learning the lessons and and digging in as well. Um, you know, you recently passed uh, a five hundred thousand dollar appropriation for uh, a regional pandemic center that um, that you know there's the that that could be here in Montgomery County. And tell us a little bit about why why you are supportive of this idea of a pandemic center, and what what benefit do you think such a center could bring to the county and to the region? Thank you, Anne. I'm I'm really uh, thrilled about this emerging idea here which comes from a group of the region's leading thinkers. And I know that you are part of this group, uh, Montgomery College, many of our, our Economic Development Corporation, part of a collaboration of regional thinkers who are looking at the, the long-term issues that we face here generally, and came together to come up with a vision for pandemic response in the future. The specific idea is to um, have a federal institute, it would ultimately be federally funded, but it, would, it starts with a kind of public private, as a public private venture that can take the known pathogens in the world and then begin to research treatments and, and therapies and vaccines for them now uh, before they become pandemics. So for example, this coronavirus that has gripped the world, this coronavirus, as we famously know, was known to science. I mean, it was in a lab. Um, it was might have been in multiple labs. Um, so those pandemic potentially, like those pathogens that have the potential to become pandemics are often identified by science. What we don't have the resources to do, what companies don't have the resources to do is figure out how to create treatments or therapies for them before they become pandemics. Because obviously before it becomes a pandemic, there's no market to sell a private product for. So it has to be federally or governmentally funded. So what, what we're working on through this initiative is to the first big project. And the Gates Foundation is, is stepping up as a funder. It's the state of Maryland is going to step up. It's going to really, it's exciting. We're going to take the top 100 known pathogens in the world, assessed according to their risk, and then try to develop monoclonal antibody therapies for them. Um, and you know the technology to do that is is certainly improving. And Montgomery County is a place where that kind of research really is happening. And we have the NIH and the FDA, which are very involved in the design and approval for these kinds of therapies. But what is lacking is the ability to fund taking a scientific innovation or breakthrough all the way through a clinical trial. Um, so that's very expensive. So the idea is to get the federal government to pay for 100 uh, monoclonal antibody therapies for different known pathogens and then stockpile them. And so in the event of a future outbreak, if it is one of the identified pathogens, then we would have already on the shelf uh, the, this therapy, which would prevent like the extreme loss of life. I mean, that wouldn't necessarily stop the pandemic, but it would mean that those who got sick, there would be a treatment for them potentially on hand. And then we wouldn't have hopefully the, the massive death tolls that we have seen, unfortunately, through COVID-19. So um, 
ideas like that, you know, there will be many, many thousands of others, but it's the kind of idea that people in Montgomery County are, are working on because they work at NIH or they work at one of the many life sciences companies or the academic institutions here. And they're, you know, they're, they're putting these kinds of plans together. And so what we would like to do is get the federal government to fund this institution and have it reside here in Montgomery County alongside NIH and FDA and our, and our private sector leadership and, and companies. And then, you know, that would be a major piece of our, of our preparation going forward. And of course, for Montgomery County, it would become a absolutely central driver of our continued economic development because companies would want to come here and the research dollars would be here and like the whole ecosystem of pandemic response you know, would be even more here in Montgomery County. And, and there, there needs to be a massive investment in pandemic preparedness in the future. We can't, we can't just go back to the old way, hoping it doesn't happen. You know, we have to invest in ongoing preventive uh, strategies. And, you know, if we don't, that would just be really unfortunate, but I think we will. And so we want Montgomery County to be right there in the middle of it. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the most exciting, important thing about your vision for the center to be in Montgomery County is that it's not only about the immediate um, immunotherapy, biology, you know, biology and, and um, you know, vaccinations, that research, but it's also about preparedness. And it's also about thinking about how the how we work together in a broader public health perspective, how we kind of shift some of the ways we think about things. And I think this is very exciting. It, it has a significant, what I hear from you is there's a significant community engagement piece in this and community learning piece in this that I think is super important and, and really exciting. We can't, we can't, as you say, we can't just rely only on the vaccine or on the, the treatment. There has to be other kind of preparation as well. Well, USG is super excited about about this center. We just we just think that it will create all kinds of opportunities that we hope to contribute through the students graduating from USG and helping to to fuel the talent pipeline. Um, our partnership with our with our local with the um, the state of the art research center uh, institute for bioscience and biotechnology research, and we're just very excited about this possibility of it coming to Montgomery County. How do you see the role for education in particular, or research in particular, with respect to this new um, this uh, pandemic center? Do you see? You've talked about the partnerships with government and with government agencies and with the with the um, with the business community, with the the industry. Um, you've touched a little bit on education, but how do you see the role for educational partnerships and research partnerships in particular um, with respect to the pandemic center? Well, I think the academic institutions will be anchor partners in any kind of strategy. And when you when you look at our potential here, uh, you know you can you can really see how that comes together. You know, we have USG here with thousands of students, and we're trying to grow our graduates in the in STEM fields. You know, you can imagine training the future of of manufacturing, of vaccine manufacturing, biomanufacturing right here in Montgomery County, you've seen how important it is to have the capacity to build, uh, to, to manufacture these, for example, vaccines. Having a really powerful program right here, would that would be part of any, like having that workforce strategy and that made in the, you know, made locally, made in the USA strategy is gonna be an absolutely essential part of the future pandemic planning. But, you look at Johns Hopkins is just over the road, one of the public health leaders globally, partnerships between Hopkins and USG. You know, we would love to see uh, that kind of collaboration. The University of Maryland, you know, just around the corner, a global powerhouse as in, in many fields, but science and computer science being one of them, the, the role of big data and, and quantum computing in all of this, I think, is potentially very significant. So for USG, I think it has just tremendous potential to be a center of this, this hub because you're connected to NIH, uh, to NIST, and to FDA. You know, you're, you're, the, you're the leading local academic institution here in Montgomery County, and you're already positioned to partner with University of Maryland 
uh, University System of Maryland um, programs. You are, you know, you have, you have. I was there with you at USG to announce announce the Translational Life Sciences Institute, the partnership with UMBC. So exciting, you know. Uh, it's just that kind of work is going to be absolutely core to the success of this vision. So I would hope that, and I believe that USG would be a, uh, you know, a, an integral part of this organization and who knows, could even incubate it. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we need, Montgomery County needs to shine a light on USG and we need the state to really invest in USG and kind of make USG fulfill the, a, a bigger potential than, you know, I think people are talking about now. Let's, let's, we need to take USG to a, to a new level. And I think the pandemic center strategy might be the kind of partnership that can help us leverage that up and build these programs for, for kids. So, that, you know, if you're, if you're in middle school in Montgomery County, this is a big experience. You, you, you're gonna, this is gonna stick with you your whole life. And, you know, you might think a little differently about careers in um, life sciences or, or government, you know, after this, after this experience that we've been through. And so to have pathways and, you know, whether it is you want to be a tech, uh, um, you know, building, manufacturing, you know, vaccines, or do you want to be a PhD scientist, you know, helping to invent them? E either way, we've got, you know, the door is open here right through USG. Wow. Yeah, I, I love hearing you talk about USG, Hans. This is um, very exciting. We feel the same way. We, we have these amazing nine university partners, part of the University System of Maryland. We are here in service of the University System of Maryland and to Montgomery County. And we really want to be that hub of innovation, that space of translation, that place where academic institutions meet business in a really powerful um, and you know impactful way uh, that, you know, for the best. So we're excited about the future and really excited to work with you as well. You know, you started, you touched on the term pathways. I think this is a really important part of the future of Montgomery County. And I know you've been a, an advocate for thinking about as we come out of COVID, what's next for our educational ecosystem? How do we address the immediate challenges of the impact of COVID on our economy and on job loss? How do we, how do we innovate? How do we prepare the, 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 the community to take on new jobs, but also how do we build stronger pipelines, pathways, so all students in an equitable manner can have access to top educational opportunities. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you think about the, the, the future of our educational ecosystem? You know, from K through 12, we've got the amazing partner, Montgomery College, this phenomenal community college that has national stature and has just is so accomplished and such a great partner. We've got USG there to, to help students earn their four-year degrees and graduate degrees as well. And then you have this arc, you know, continuing that, you know, we want to think about people in a continuous educational arc all the way through their jobs, pivoting, trying new things, working with WorkSource Montgomery and others to try to identify new things. Um, how are you thinking about this educational ecosystem as we come out of COVID? And, you know, there it's it's a crisis time, but Christ, there's also this amazing opportunity now to kind of rethink what we've done. And I'm wondering how you're you're thinking about that. Well, I, th I'm, I'm, I'm inspired is how I'm thinking about it. I, I think that this is where jurisdictions that are really moving fast and making progress have very strong game plans for that intersection of higher ed and economic development. And, you know, it's interesting because Montgomery County over the years um, has relied on UMD, I think. But in a way, UMD kind of got farther and farther and farther away from us, uh, you know, geog geographically as traffic has gotten worse and, and it's just, it, but we need to kind of reintegrate and we need to really chart a path aggressively where USG is the place that our life sciences companies, our technology companies, our hospitality companies, you know, they are all working together in a public, in a spirit of public private partnership to you know, support the workforce development and to support entrepreneurship. Um, 
and you know, to, to move us forward. So, you know, a few years ago, I think these programs were happening more in silos, like USG was building its programs. Montgomery College was building its programs. What we need to do is take it to the level of intentionality and have Montgomery County government you know, with a clear vision, working with the state, working with the University of System of Maryland, working with Johns Hopkins, working with USG as our the kind of you know the lead entry for us into the sector and and get more investment, get more programs. Like let's let's have incredibly clear pathways for kids coming up, starting at the youngest ages, more STEM programs in our K through 12, you know, transitioning through kids graduating from high school with a with a degree from Montgomery College and and then quickly being able to complete their degree work at USG. It's an affordable education strategy that provides a, a deep workforce and you know, it, it is a really uh, remarkable model. I think we're really lucky to have USG here. So we've got to just step up, I think, our coordination and our convening and our collaboration. And I, you know, I think it's within our grasp, but it's just got to become a, a bigger priority. And then ultimately, I think what we really need to do is take that to the next level with partnerships with NIH and NIST and FDA and, and our labs, because for us, those are... I like to think of NIH and, and NIST and FDA as like the, the Harvard, MIT, Stanford of, you know, Montgomery County. And, you know, let's let's link all of them up so that USG and it has more and bigger programs directly with NIH and is able to get the benefit of all these thousands and thousands of scientists who come here from all over the world. You know, USG should be known all over the world as a place where we're really moving the ball forward. Yeah, oh, I, I love the vision. It's very exciting and we embrace it as well. I, I really think we can be that spot of a lot of the coordination and working with everyone to connect dots, as you say, it's, it can't be done by any single institution. We all have to, we all have to figure it out. Um, I, I'll just share a little story with you. When I was at Virginia Tech, I had a, a mentor who, who one day told me that I was too preoccupied with trying to make the school that I led, the School of Public and International Affairs, she said, why are you always trying to make that school great? You should be trying to figure out how that school can make Virginia Tech great, and then you'll be successful. And in some ways it was kind of a no brainer, but it really flipped me upside down. And I think that that's our challenge. What, what I hear you saying is that, you know, we all have to kind of step out of our out of our silos and out of ourselves and see this, the potential of this collaboration, the potential of working together. And um, we're ready to do it. So we, we can't wait to work with the council and with all of our partners to, to do that as well. Well, let me just ask you, wrapping up here, let me just ask you to, um, you know, reflect on vaccination right now. Our vaccination rates are, are going up pretty well in the county. We're, we're doing really well and doing well in the state of Maryland as well. Um, but there still is a lot of vaccine hesitancy. There still are people who just aren't sure about getting the vaccine. And, um, you know, what what do you see as the, um, you know, the core message that people need to hear about vaccination uh, and getting back into the swing of things? Right. We are we are indeed in the hardest part of the vaccination campaign now because those who have not yet been vaccinated are less connected and we've, we've got to make those connections. Um, I think that it's really important for our residents to understand that the vaccinations really work. Uh, they are basically 100 percent effective against serious illness. And I'm, I'm concerned that there is some something of a perception that, you know, there are any number of things that you should do to try to avoid getting COVID, like, you know, don't, you know, maybe wear a mask or, you know, don't don't gather indoors or or maybe get vaccinated, get vaccinated. And, and they're all sort of all good things to do, but any one of them isn't necessarily more important than the other. Vaccinations are the answer. They are totally effective. And I, I just, I'm concerned that there is a lack of appreciation. You know, a lot of people are sort of reeling at this moment in time. Today, you know, the CDC has really come out with clearer guidance about mask wearing. And, 
they're letting people know, like, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. I have talked to so many people who are vaccinated and are, are, are not yet comfortable taking off the mask. And, you know, the reason is there isn't a full understanding about how effective the vaccinations really are and how safe you really are once you've been vaccinated. And, you know, that I think has to sink in. You know, we've got to reach people and, and we have to take the vaccines to them. I mean, I think that's the, the final phase of this journey here is we've got to be out on street corners and, you know, knocking on doors and visiting churches and visiting playgrounds um, and, and, and restaurants. Like we've got to go that, that final mile here and, and approach people who are just, you know, not as connected. I also think we have to provide some incentives now. I think I think we're at that stage where, you know, it, it would be well worth it to provide somebody with a twenty-five or fifty-dollar, uh, you know, uh, restaurant coupon for their favorite restaurant to get vaccinated. Just because, um, who knows why that that last fraction of the population there there are some who certainly doubt, you know, like have an aversion to it. But I think there's also a lot who just have, you know, they just need a nudge. It's it's not you don't have to um, kind of completely overturn their thinking. It's it's more of a nudge kind of situation. And I think we've we've got a long way to go before we get through the nudge uh, population. And that's that's really the critical piece to help folks stay protected. So I think as the as the other public health measures are withdrawn and it's just becoming more and more clear that. The, the, the final uh, measure is the vaccinations and those who get them are protected and those who don't are not. Um, hopefully we can get that message out and, and really get all the way to the finish line here. What a great uh, point to end on and a great, a great message for all of us to hear. Uh, Council Member Reamer, this has been a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks for sharing your vision about the Pandemic Center and the future of the county. And also thank you so much for everything you're doing every single day with all your colleagues to keep us all safe and moving forward during this time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ann. It's really my pleasure. I'm a huge fan of USG and I just, uh, I'm glad to be with you. I look forward to working together much closer in the future. We look forward to it as well. Thank you so much.